Yes, thank you for inviting me here to speak about this site. Um, I spent the whole of 2006 in the East Kirk of St Nicholas um, carrying out this excavation. I'm going to try in an hour to summarise what we found. Um, the Kirk of St Nicholas uh, were wanting to redevelop what is the, called the East Kirk, which is about half of the Church of St Nicholas in Aberdeen. Uh, they have um, put over the East Kirk to a trust, um, a, non a, a non religious trust, and they um, are going to have uh, a development of um, space for various art forms in the up upstairs, so ballet, conferences, uh, exhibitions. They're going to have a, a cafe with um, facilities for training people to uh, cook and to, you know, to, to be independent and live away from home. And then in the basement area, they um, are going to, have, going to have meeting rooms, places that uh, can be hired out to make income. And so it was this area in which the excavation really was involved. And um, the Kirk of St Nicholas, very briefly, its history is that the West Kirk is completely separate from this development. So when I'm talking about the church, I'm really only talking about the East Kirk. Uh, and the West Kirk, um, which you can see here, uh, built in the 1750s, um, the, the transept here uh, is a sort of dividing area between the two kirks. Uh, and then the East Kirk, you can see here, this is actually the 15th century church still standing in 1822. Um, and then this was demolished in 1837 to wait, make way for a better, bigger East Kirk. Um, and then it was burnt down in the 1870s. Uh, this is a picture of the 1874 fire, which um, started in the steeple area. And at the time, the newspapers said the East Kirk was completely demolished by fire. But when we were digging, we initially found, on the virtually the first day of the dig, that um, the walls inside the church, once the materials had been stripped off the inner walls, that the walls were, were charred. And so historical research into that 1874 fire actually showed that although the steeple did collapse into the East Kirk, uh, the walls remained standing. And that in fact the 1874, um, well 1830s and then 1870s walls, so the 19th century church, was actually built onto the 15th century church. So this is the uh, 1874 fire. But underneath that we found the 15th century choir wall so that what they had done in 1837 was to take down the 15th century church, but to use really the walls and the foundations of, of the 15th century church uh, as a foundation for the 19th century church. Um, and here you can see again this, again you can see the charring, the blackening on the wall here, and then you can see this step, and this is the 15th century church wall. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but that was a sort of introduction just very briefly to the history of this part of the church itself, and obviously I'll be going into a bit more detail about what we found on the excavation. Essentially, the 15th century church um, was um, on the same ground plan as the, the standing church, which is there today. And the area of the, the, the excavation that we, um, that, we, that, we, that we were involved in, in excavating uh, was an area 20 by 20 in size, and we were to go down um, four meters. And so within that, we found very substantial uh, structural remains, which actually had to be demolished as part of this project. So these are the two of the sleeper walls, um, the foundation walls under the pillars of the 15th century church. And this is a drawing of the 15th century church, um, which was, was, was um, undertaken in the oh, well, early 19th century before the, this church was demolished. And you can see here the pillars or piers, uh, and the walls underneath here were the ones that we found uh, on the excavation. Now this is a picture just to show you what the dig looked like. So at the time we were doing the dig um, in 2006, as I said, I mean, I was there for the whole year doing the excavation. Um, and you can see the size of the dig. These are the two um, sleeper walls here. And again, you can see the outside walls of the 19th century church. The excavation, um, it took, it took a, the whole year to, to carry out this dig. Uh, it involved um, over 80 staff altogether, including a core of 30 archaeologists, full-time you know, um, professional archaeologists, plus um, a number of archaeology students, um, a small number of school children, uh, and a small number of volunteers, um, se uh, several of whom, well, one of whom is certainly in the room tonight, but um, many who have been on other excavations with me um, we have just wanted to point out that we have 
uh, a conveyor belt here for taking the soil away from the site because 1,600 cubic metres of soil um, is quite a substantial amount to remove uh, through a small door um, of the church. And so what we did was we had the conveyor belt went out of the, the window at the east of the church and down a chute and into a skip, which was replaced every day. Uh, and then just very briefly, just for, to, to, to um, show you that this gallery around the East Coast actually allowed people to come and visit the dig. So we had over 14,000 people visit the dig in 2006. Now some of those were people who came regularly, you know, people would come once a week to see what we'd found. Uh, what we had, um, 70 school classes uh, and quite a number of other people uh, could watch us through this little window here um, to see the progress of the dig. So the 15th century church, um, as I said, it was on the footprint of the 19th century church. Um, and these big sleeper walls, these very, very substantial structural remains um, that we obviously found on the excavation. This is really to show you how they sort of fit in with each other. That uh, This is the transept that I pointed out on the, on the slide, which is not involved in the, in the excavation. Um, and is a sort of division between the West Kirk and the East Kirk. These two big sleeper walls. Uh, and then this area called St Mary's Chapel here is also a small medieval chapel uh, that again was redeveloped in the, in the 19th century. And um, this um, is at a lower level to the area of the East Kirk. So they're actually on a slope downwards towards the east, which is this way here. So our dig was sort of almost on two levels in the sense that we were digging out this area here down to meet the ground floor here. Um, and to allow people to enter the new development through here and into the area that we'd excavated. So that's the sort of um, plan of the 15th century church. We have a series of stairs here which would have taken us between the, those two levels in the medieval period, um, and also windows and doors in the 15th century church. So we have here, these are not particularly good for us. I'm going to show you um, again just some of those different um, aspects of the structural remains. The, some of these things are both incredibly difficult to photograph. For example, on the south wall, there was actually a construction corridor. And uh, this is in discussions with Richard Fawcett, who came up several times to the dig. We looked at various aspects of the architectural um, remains, which, of course, were very complex. And um, we had noted that the floor, there was a mortar floor running downwards towards the east, so down this level that I taught these different, two different levels. And he's suggesting that this is what he would call a construction corridor, which would have allowed people to move materials um, from the two different levels in the medieval period down a, a corridor. But this was incredibly difficult to photograph because um, you can imagine for health and safety reasons, we had to have a lot of pillars built in. So these are new steel beams that were put in. You can see our walkways that we had. So some of these large elements were very, very difficult to photograph. But that construction corridor was very, very unusual, apparently. Um, and um, yet to find many uh, excavated examples of something like that. Uh, the doors, um, which would have taken you, uh, when you went down the stairs or the construction corridor, would have taken you into St Mary's, um, were 15th century granite, so some of the very earliest granite working, um, and quite a number of, of mason's marks were recorded. This star is recorded all over the, the stones of these doors, um, and I know some of you will know the problems with um, mason's marks in the sense of actually being able to allocate them to different masons but we have n we have names of some of the masons who were involved obviously in the construction of this 15th century church uh, I show you this view because of course the 15th century church has cut through uh, an earlier graveyard which I'll, sh I'll show you about in a minute uh, this lovely little set of stairs um, we actually um, broke into this little vault. Um, we, they knew that there were stairs there, but they hadn't been seen for many, many years. Um, and so this, they got rather, um, you know, covered in debris and large bits of stonework had been put in there. But uh, we think it's very likely that the top of the stairs was, was blocked off at the Reformation. And so that's the brick blocking that probably dates to the Reformation when the church was divided up into different areas. And so this plan shows you that division that at the Reformation, the doors between the two areas went out of use and the window was blocked, uh, and also the stairs blocked. And again, historical research uh, says that after the Reformation, the, the kirks were divided, the West Kirk from the East Kirk, and also from St Mary's, so into really three separate churches. Um, and so we have archaeological evidence for 
the, the, the blocking of these windows and doors, but also this wall which was constructed in 1596, and again we have documentary reference to that wall, which then partitioned off the East Kirk from the West Kirk um, with this very substantial wall. And after the Reformation, we know that wooden um, galleries were built onto the uh, north side of the church because we found several bases for this wooden structure, uh, several areas where um, up to 12 um, gravestones were stacked on top of each other. Unfortunately, no remains of the wooden structure itself, but because a huge amount of grave digging had taken place in the area. But um, three stacks in a row suggested that there had been a wooden gallery um, along the side of the church. Um, and that's something that the historical research is not complete for this site. So that's one thing that we, you know, we will be doing more work on to looking at uh, these galleries because we could probably find out when they were built and who built them. Uh, and just to show you one of the gravestones, when we were dismantling these stacks of gravestones, of course, a lot of them were, were reused. And so we had fantastic inscriptions and different names. Uh, this is just one of the most interesting, which is when we turned it over, uh, we could see it says A.N. Melville, Master of Music, uh, and then several dates, and it's been re-inscribed re a couple of times. But essentially, we have historical reference for the, the death of Andrew Melville, who was the Master of Music in the Song School in Aberdeen uh, in 1640. And so this is his gravestone, which was then reused uh, in the post-Reformation period, um, well, after 1640, obviously, uh, to, to when a, a, a gallery was built in the church. And we had a lot of um, Masonic, sorry, Mason's um, pieces, so stonework uh, and other um, masonry uh, to do with the 15th century church, which of course a lot of it had collapsed into the church and just been left, so um, small pillars, decorative um, portions of stone, uh, this lovely um, face uh, had been used, this, the stone had just been rebuilt into a wall um, that we had to dismantle as part of the project. So. We have um, about 2,000 pieces of stonework. Uh, and again, this post-excavation is not complete for various reasons. And the stone is one of the things that we have not finished looking at. But Richard Fawcett has looked at it and shown his hands up in the air with delight at the quality uh, and slight horror at the quantity, of course, of the, of the remains. But uh, that's something that we'll be working through over the next few years to, to get all that looked at, uh, dated, obviously, and then published. And again, all the glass, uh, you know, huge quantities of different glass from different periods. Um, there's still some quite old glass in the, the kirk itself, um, but lots and lots of different um, <coughs> periods of, 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 of stained glass from the 15th century church. Uh, and lots of plaster and other, other, other elements of the church. So again, when that post excavation is complete, we'll have quite a, a good picture of the, what the 15th century church looked like. Uh, a little fragment of a bell. Uh, I mean, we had thousands of small finds, again, which we haven't looked, been able to go through every one of them thoroughly yet, but uh, this fragment of copper alloy bell. Um, and St. Nicholas has got one of the, I think it's the largest carillon in Britain, uh, with 48 bells, and it's always had a very well-known set of bells, and of course they're mentioned in a lot of documents. Uh, so it was rather nice to find this little fragment of one of the copper alloy bells. And one of the things that we found, um, oh, I've mentioned gravestones, but quite often we found that they were using gravestones to make almost areas of paving or areas of you know, flooring um, under which there were a group of burials. So for example, this, uh, this um, group of three gravestones, uh, under that are six individuals who've been buried, presumably from the same family. Uh, and we, of course, don't know if this, this is a 1679, 1689, um, I think a couple uh, you know, have been uh, commemorated on this gravestone. But of course, we don't know if that's actually the people that we excavated underneath, because we don't know the identity of any of the individuals that we excavated, because there are no burial records from the, the medieval period. Um, and so at the moment, we don't have any names of any of the individuals. We excavated nearly a 1,000 burials altogether from the earliest period, which I'm going to talk about in a minute up to the latest ones, which were very late 17th or early 18th century. These later burials were very, very well preserved. Um, coffins, coffin fittings. Unfortunately, no name plates and no dates. Um, we were just a little bit too early for that. I think if they'd gone on another 50 years, we might have had a name plate or a, or a date. 
Um, the, the coffins were so well preserved in some cases that although when you dismantled them they were very crumbly, you could look at the, um, the way that the coffins had been constructed. So the, the tongue and groove jointing of the base um, portion of the, of the coffin and then long planks uh, used for the side and short planks for, for each of the ends. Um, some of the coffins had coffin st uh, strengtheners on the corners uh, and some of them had one or two sets of, of, of iron handles. In some of the coffins, we found that they'd been uh, whitewashed inside. Uh, and again, this is something that is, um, is known from these sort of later burials. We also found evidence of um, material inside, so things like sawdust, which had seemed to have been put round the, the body um, prior to being laid in, in the coffin. And so quite a lot of different elements within the coffins themselves. Uh, we found rope. Um, here, I've just pointed that out because that's a little bit difficult. Was a little bit difficult to photograph, but several examples where rope appeared to have been either thrown into the uh, once the coffin had been lowered, or actually broken. Um, and again, that hasn't been analysed yet. But it seemed to be very fine rope that they were using. So um, maybe not surprising, therefore, that they had breakages uh, regularly as they lowered the coffin into the grave. And quite a lot of things in with the um, individuals. Uh, we found, um, I don't know how to say this exactly, but we don't find many coins on digs in Aberdeen. Um, and so partly that's to do with the very acidic soils in Aberdeen, I have to say. But um, we did find over 80 coins within burials in this, you know, within the coffins um, of the, from the 15th century to um, the, the early 18th century. And so I'm just pointing out some here. Most of them were between the sort of chest and the, and the pelvic area. So it had been placed underneath the coffin lid, you know, in with the, the burial, it's the, the individual themselves. But one coffin, which um, was a part of a group of six uh, individuals who had been buried in one uh, family burial group, five adults and one child. Uh, this adult had actually four coins had been thrown onto the lid of the coffin um, and so there's, there's one here, one here, one here. And this is just a little detail showing them. Then, and they'd actually corroded onto the lid. Now, that lid had then collapsed, but they had been already become corroded on. And these coins were dated to the two to the 1630s and two to the 1690s. So they're almost they are evidence of our latest burial. Um, I obviously at this point want to point out, of course, that at the Reformation in 1560, there were supposed to be no burials within church in churches, but we have a maybe a couple of hundred who were buried after that period. We think uh, some of the burials it was a bit difficult to date, but around about that many uh, were actually buried after the Reformation. And this, of course, was families who already had purchased an area of the church, uh, who maybe had already buried one individual and wanted to continue burying uh, the other members of their family. So, um, but very very good dating evidence for for a lot of these burials. Also, a lot of uh, textiles in with the individuals. Now, no complete items apart from a number of hats. Um, you can see here a very well-preserved hat with a central button and radiating out, radiating ribbon. Um, and again, we haven't had these analysed yet. This is part of the ongoing post-excavation process. Uh, but these actually haven't been looked at, unfortunately, yet. But there are several different styles. You can see a slightly different one here, almost like a leathery material. Um, but also quite a number of others that weren't as well preserved as that. Uh, but also elements of the clothing. So we didn't find any complete garments, you know, um, as such, but we found a lot of decorative elements. This is incredibly difficult to see because it's brown material on brown soil. But there's a bow here. This is the, the shin here, so the knee, the ankle. And there's a bow here, tied here, and one tied here. Uh, just below the knees, um, you know, suggesting sort of knickerbocker style garment. But also we found quite a lot of uh, trim sort of round the ankles, round the wrists, um, and in other places, and also bows of sort of silk ribbon um, decorating various garments. And also a few small finds in with the, the burials themselves. I mean, this was a particularly interesting find. Um, this is a, a middle-aged female who had very severe osteomalacia, vitamin D deficiency. And she had obviously been ill for a very long time. And she was buried with this little copper alloy 
um, token, which is an image, well, a PHR, which is the Virgin Mary with the body of Jesus over her knee. Now, this is a well-known image, but so far we haven't been able to find a parallel for this as a, a possible pilgrimage token. Uh, it's obviously been broken, um, not during the excavation, I hope. Um, but it was buried underneath her, her pelvis, and so she'd obviously been carrying it or uh, you know, wanted to be buried with it. Um, and again, we have a lot more work to do on this, to look to find out where she had maybe visited, you know, maybe been on a pilgrimage, uh, but so far we haven't been able to find or link this to a particular church. Uh, and also, well, this is just a nice little interesting one. There's a little gun flint here which was on the, again on the pelvis of an individual. Um, maybe it had been in a little bag or you know, in an item of clothing. Um, so you know, a small number of items like that found in with these later burials. Uh, and obviously also clothing fastness. So the little, this lovely little heart-shaped, copper heart-shaped brooch here over this heart of this um, man. Um, and of course quite a number of leg and arm positions. Now archaeologists can talk a lot about this sort of you know what it all means, but really just wanted to show you a couple. Um, one, well, the legs we had quite a number of different, um, including actually across ankles. Uh, but this is quite a nice one where we have the arms here up in a sort of praying or clasping position. Um, and we had wondered when we excavated the fingers if there might be anything in that grasp, um, but unfortunately nothing. Uh, but rather nice sort of arm <coughs> position there. But the most unusual position, um, and I haven't satisfactorily explained this yet, but uh, then you may have suggestions in question time. Uh, this is a middle-aged man who is lying face down. Um, he has um, got one of his arms behind his back and one in front. So um, he's lying, I don't know if I want to demonstrate this, but one in front and one of his arms behind. Now there was no um, evidence of anything tying the hands together uh, you can see here the arm over the back, and then there's two sets of fingers here that are all together. Um, I mean, there's been suggestions that maybe his coffin got turned over in transit into the, the church, that occasionally you do hear about an accident where a coffin falls off a, you know, a cart and it gets turned upside down. Um, but the sort of neat way that the, those arms are together, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, but apart from that, he was buried obviously in a very expensive location close to the... Um, the, the high altar, you know, in the East Kirk. So his family paid an awful lot of money at the time for him to be buried there. He was the most unusual position we had. Most people were buried in, in the very, in very traditional way, uh, and quite a lot of objects in with these, in, in with the soil, you know, rather than on the individuals themselves. Uh, thousands of little pins. This is quite a nice one on the left, which has had lots of little um, beads on it, and a little sort of luck and booth. Um, Little, little portion of a brooch here, but again, sort of thousands of really of, of small finds, um, far too many really to, to go into any detail today. Uh, but other little things like book fittings, um, again, lots and lots of little copper alloy fittings, bosses, um, this lovely little key here, a little copper alloy key, and we found several of those uh, on the excavation. And so that's the 15th century church, which was demolished in the early 19th century. But when, of course, we were digging down, we were obviously dismantling the 15th century church, uh, creating this open space for this, you know, this new trust. Um, and we found that in the 15th century, they'd actually left a lot of earlier remains in situ. So in fact, we had um, at least three earlier medieval churches in the 15th century. Uh, and that's because instead of dismantling everything in the 15th century, they actually just dug away small areas and built into the earlier structures. So here you've got the, the wall of what we later found out was a, a, a late 12th century church. Uh, and what they've done is they just cut through that to create these pillar bases, these pier bases, uh, and literally used the 12th century church as sort of foundations for, for the 15th century church. So, I mean, we were incredibly lucky that, you know, things had just not been swept aside. And in fact, they brought material in um, in the 15th century to level up the ground. Um, so you'll see in a minute when I show you the 12th century churches, you know, how well preserved they actually were. So what we have in summary is we have, um, we have a later 12th century church in yellow here, which actually replaced an early to mid 12th century church in green. Now, we think that for some reason, this, this wall became unstable 
and, and I have to be replaced because it's only got a gap of 40 centimetres in between it. So um, possibly because the ground slopes away very strong, very um, steeply at that point, it may be that that wall wasn't built very well in the first place and they had to replace it. So you've got middle 12th century, later 12th century. I'm going to come on to the little blue structure in a minute, of course. Um, and so I'll just run through showing you a few pictures of these, uh, these structures. So later 12th century, uh, pilaster buttress here, and east end of the late 12th century church. So we have the full outline of, of that east church, um, including going along to the end. The buttresses were rather less well preserved at that end, but you could see where they had been. Um, the east wall still standing three courses high. Uh, and here's some details of the buttresses just to show you how well preserved these are. Um, inside, still again, still standing a few courses high, uh, and including whitewash on the wall, which is, is for some reason when that's been put in, it's been dri it's dripped down onto the floor here. Um, not very well applied, I have to say. Uh, and the corner here, again, this is the corner of the later, inside of the later 12th century church. And you can see how it's sitting in, in the, this is the, the later church, you can see how it's sort of sitting within that. So since the 15th century, all of these structures and layers I'm talking about from now on have been inside, which is one of the reasons that they're actually quite well preserved, because they're in a sort of a dry, sandy soil. Uh, and again, just a detail of that, um, the still standing that high uh, inside the late 12th century. You can see it's been cut through. There's a big cut here where you know, a later burial has gone in, but uh, still incredibly well preserved. Uh, and again, lots of stonework from the 12th century church. And again, this is just to prove that Richard came to the site. And uh, so he was, oh, as I said, I mean, obviously very interested in the, the range of stonework that we had from that, from that fa these phases. Uh, and again, a small amount of other um, structural remains, various tiny pieces of window glass, um, fairly poorly preserved. On the 12th century church, a structure had been built onto the north of that, and we have these two walls, uh, which had then been cut through in the 15th century. So at some point, probably in the 12th century, this building had been um, built onto the north side of the church, which we wondered if it might have been a sacristy. There is, um, there's a historical references to a sacristy being built on the north side, um, and so we think that this is likely to be the uh, location of it. Again, very, very difficult to, to photograph in, in a hole because of all the lights. You can see the individual lights people had to work with um, and all, obviously the, all the steel work. But essentially, this is the north wall of the 12th century church and the sacristy, sacristy walls coming out here, then cut by the, the later wall. So. But inside the sacristy, very, very well preserved, floor layers, structural remains, and a lot of finds just from that, in that small area. So large numbers of pieces of copper alloy, different um, items like chain, horse, possibly horse harness, quite a number of different pieces of bone. Um, These are some of the nice pieces, a little whistle, lovely little barbed bone pin here, um, and other elements. Uh, and also a huge amount of pottery. Now, most of the pottery, of course, we had on the site is, has, be, has been moved around many times, but a really nice selection of sort of 12th to 13th century pottery um, from this, this area that we, we call in the sacristy. Um, and it's possible that actually the, that, that the sacristy building went out of use as a sacristy and um, possibly was, was maybe something more domestic because a lot of the pottery is cooking pots and, and jugs and you know, sort of more domestic wares. And the burials from the 12th century, um, about half of the, the burials that we had ex excavated um, date to the earlier period, you know, pre-15th century. Um, and a small number of them were um, in things like sarcophagus. This is, this is Dunfermline, just to show um, this, what, which part. This, this is part of a sarcophagus here. Um, and we have several bits of lids of stone coffins. But most of the burials were just in shrouds, no evidence of coffins. Um, this is showing you the, the east wall of the East Kirk, and this is the graveyard outside uh, and the 15th century wall. So you can see this is, these survive in that gap between the east wall of the 12th century church and where they put the 15th century church. Uh, interestingly, you can see 
here that a lot of the feet bones are missing because when they cut a trench along here, we think when the 15th century wall was built, they took all the feet away of those individuals but left, well, there was about three layers, you know, three um, different layers of, of individuals who all wanted to be buried with their head next to the outside of the east wall. Uh, and quite a number of people buried uh, in particular places like round about the buttresses, and this is one of the buttresses on the south side, and again, quite a uh, you know, group of cl very closely buried individuals uh, next to these buttresses. But also quite a number of very deep burials, and at that time, within the church, um, we had a group of very deep, uh, but not intercutting burials, so uh, you know, burials that had been marked and were not, uh, not really intercutting each other. Very well preserved bone. And not many finds within the actual, you know, with the actual burials, but um, a number who had been on, presumably been on pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, so um, at four uh, scallop shells um, were excavated. We have two here uh, next to the head of an individual, presumably they had been on, on a hat. Um, here one not found in a burial, but just showing you the, the detail of the, of, the of the two piercings there through the scallop shell. And this rather nice little scallop shell here, which was over the pelvis of the individual, um, presumably uh, it had been on a script <coughs> or you know, a bag um, that um, had obviously then uh, rotted away. Uh, and then just to show you here, very, very slight traces of wood alongside um, a small number of individuals that were maybe uh, remains of a staff. Um, and here you can see, I've just to, to illustrate the, the staff and the, the scallops on the... Uh, the hat there. Uh, I mean, obviously, very, very interesting for us to to be able to link, you know, St. Nicholas. People had gone to on, on pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Um, not a huge number of burials from Scotland that um, you know have been excavated with with scallop shells. And so I said that there'd been a, a sort of mid early to mid 12th century church which had then uh, collapsed. And so we're starting to, as we were excavating, you know, starting to find evidence of this, uh, these earlier walls um, and the sort of relation as we were picking the, the site apart um, and finding the evidence of these earlier walls here. Um, and so, again, just using this plan, uh, the sort of mid to uh, early to mid 12th century wall here, uh, and underneath this um, later wall here, a stone coffin. We didn't have many which had actually been constructed in situ. Uh, in the sense of you know a, a hole being dug and, and stones being mortared in here, um, unfortunately, when they built this walling then in the late 12th century, they'd actually taken the individual, the, the burial out, um, and had disturbed it. But um, it may it may actually relate to this very early church or or to the sort of mid 12th century church. And so that's um, a sort of summary of what we what we were finding. And really just to show you now the sort of, before I talk about the sort of earliest period, that um, the, the sort of pinky colour here uh, is the 15th century church. And so within that we've got, you can see the pillar bases that I talked about that had cut away the earlier church. Um, we've got the later 12th century structure in, in, in yellow here, and then in green the, um, you know, the mid 12th century church. But this little blue, which I haven't really, ha haven't really uh, highlighted yet, is the earliest structure that we found um, on the site. And St. Nicholas Church are very pleased that they think this is the earliest wall standing in Aberdeen at the moment. Because as part of the dig, we found this little outside end um, of a church, which might be 11th to very, very early 12th century. Uh, so I'm just going to show you some pictures of that now. Um, this is the inside of it showing you one mortar floor that had been put down. Um, you can see again later burials cutting through it, um, but you can see that um, very small number of layers uh, associated with the inside of that um, church because it presumably went out of use very, very quickly and then was truncated and enclosed <coughs> under the floor of these rectangular 12th century churches. But you can see here from the outside, you can see the circular apse here. Uh, but most interestingly, or uh, very interestingly, we found um, 25, the burials of 25 small children um, almost radiating out from this wall. And you can see here some of the burials. I'm going to show you details of pictures of, of these individuals. This is a plan showing 
the, the burials. And you can see how they appear to radiate out from this outside the wall. Apart from in this corner here where they go much more um, sort of east-west or not, not really on, on, on a good alignment. But they are associated with this little um, outsider wall. And some of the burials were in little stone coffins. This is one which, again, had been mortared in, so had been built into a hole, um, and the stones mortared together like a little kist. Uh, if you ignore the stone at the top there, which is actually a later stone structure, um, most, of the, most of the individuals were between about six months and, and three years. Uh, some were in other sort of stone, more unstructured stone coffins, so stone round the side, uh, headstone, some pillow stones, uh, and this one had stones roughly put over the top of it. But also some were in wooden log coffins. Um, this one preser was preserved very well because the, the wood had actually been burnt, uh, and so there was wood underneath the, the burial. Um, and we had, uh, when we were doing the dig, we decided that we would send her off a sample of this, um, you know, actually drawing the dig, and it came back to the 10th to early 11th century as a date. Now, we don't actually think that the barrels are quite that early, but unfortunately, when we sent off bone of this individual, um, we haven't been able to get a very accurate date yet because this child ate 40% fish in their diet, and um, that, at the moment, hasn't allowed us to get a better radiocarbon date than possibly sort of late 11th to early 12th century. So we think we're in that sort of late 11th to early 12th century period. Um, and associated with some of these bales, we also had quite a lot of quite early pottery, East Anglian, Low Country um, pottery. We think that the Aberdeen um, pottery industry started around about in, in the 13th century sometime. Um, and so this has interested some of the pottery specialists, um, this nice little collection of very early pottery. Uh, but other um, log burials, this is one, um, the, the log has actually been hollowed out and the wood very, very poorly preserved, but um, you know, just the sort of almost a stain of the wood, uh, hollowed out log surviving. And some of the burials appear to have been marked, so we had some st upstanding stones associated with the burials. You can also see the, the stone around the burials. We have pillow and sort of cheek stones uh, surrounding some of these children's burials but also two areas where mussel shells have been placed over a, a burial. Uh, and each of the mussel shells have been put open side down, you know, split in half and put open side down. Um, and again, there are uh, you know, parallels to that, uh, to shells marking um, burials. And other interesting burials are so, probably associated with this phase. Uh, again, just hopefully you're, you're familiar with this plan now, but cut by this mid 12th century wall, we had these two burials marked in the black there, and they were presumably associated with this outsidal church, uh, but within, it's been estimated 40 years of these burials taking place, this wall was built. And so, because the bodies weren't completely decomposed, they are actually still had, you know, they, the bones were still attached together with tendons. And so instead of actually removing the bodies, they actually concertinaed the bodies into the small space away from the wall. So they dug the trench, they found the body, and then they concertinaed the body up into this little space above the head. So when we were excavating, this is the wall, when we were excavating, we found the feet and the legs, the knees, the pelvis, the chest, sort of concertinaed. Um, and then the skull was actually in place. They hadn't moved the skull. It was, it was still in place. And it actually, one, one of these individuals had a copper alloy chain with a little lead cross um, around the neck, still in, in situ in its, in its position. Uh, and this is the only cross um, that we have from the whole site, from, from any period. Um, and obviously a very, very early find. Uh, and again, um, it's um, been a, a conservation, but not uh, been, uh, been analysed in any way yet. So uh, we're still waiting for really for results about, about that. Uh, and some of the, these earlier burials also had textiles because they were so deeply dug into the natural sort of clay material. They actually survived; you know, textiles survived very, very well uh, underneath some of the bodies. And this is a, an example of these very coarse textiles that we were we've been excavating. And 
before before the 12th century church or um, you know around about that period we also had two large ditches which may be associated with the apsidal church or these very early phases um, and I'm not really going to talk about them but there is quite a lot of evidence of, uh, sort of early activity on the site um, in, well huge ditch here um, and then a small little v-shaped ditch which ran both ran north south across the site uh, but also, prior to the outside of church being built, the area had been used as, as an industrial area. And there were quite thick layers of ash and burning, um, also evidence of fish processing, small chopped pieces of fish bone here uh, in this layer into which everything else was cut and the outside of church was placed, including uh, a little bit of an antler hammer here, suggesting sort of small-scale um, industrial working um, fish or animal bone processing, um, you know, possibly small-scale um, industrial activity. Uh, and again, there's still a lot of work to do on these on the farm, the finds from these layers. But uh, this had obviously been an area which had been, you know, heavily used even prior to the the church being built. Uh, and other layers, this lovely sort of organic layer. This is um, it looked like a cow patch, to be honest. Um, but quite a lot of these little little uh, organic layers surviving in the area around about the the, the church. Uh, and the very, very earliest layer, um, associated with fragments of burnt bone and, and some flints, and unfortunately I don't have photographs of the, of the flints, but uh, this sort of pebbly surface, which had been laid down to the east of the, the outsidal church and running down the slope that I talked about um, prior to the, you know, all, the, all the churches being built. So that's a summary of, of what we found on the site. Um, I want to now just talk a little bit about the human remains, which um, is the only portion of the, this excavated site which has been completely finished with. The, um, the remains, well, I've got the numbers of the individuals and the amount of bone that we, we excavated, uh, have been studied by Guard, by Glasgow University, uh, and the report's completed by that for that because the church wants to rebury the remains, um, possibly in this, well, late, later this year. And so we have got quite a lot of information about the analysis of the, of the human remains themselves. So 897 individuals altogether, um, and you can see roughly, well, 478 from the earlier period and 341 from the later period, so quite substantial numbers for statistical analysis. Um, also, 3.5 tons of disarticulated human bone, um, 11, representative of 1,175 individuals. So, altogether, 2,073 <coughs> individuals um, found their way into the East Kirk. Now, some of those may have come in in, in soil, to be honest, but um, you know, it does represent a, a large, you know, one of the large collections, largest collections of human remains excavated in Scotland. Uh, this is a wonderful wall which was put in and mortared and all these bones have been put into the wall foundation trench and then of course were attached with them by the mortar to the the wall and so when we excavated down these were actually attached onto the wall still you know being attached by the mortar uh, and then just to show you this is the the um, report on the human remains which has all been uh, completed uh, Again, just sort of briefly, roughly equal numbers of males and females, um, um, and, and near females and possible females. Uh, age, um, again, very typical of the medieval site. 25% of the individuals um, died when they were under three years of age, 50% under 15. So only 50% survived until they were over 15. Uh, and then, of course, only 3% were older adults, which I always or shocks me, over sort of 50 or so, um, only, th only 3%. <clears throat> um, and more children died before the 15th century, so in the earlier periods than in the later periods. Uh, and this graph is not particularly easy to see, but essentially um, this is the, 13th, the, the, sorry, the 11th to 15th century burials, and you can see more are dying than in the earlier period in the yellow line here, um, indicating possible better um, child nutrition, uh, child health generally, uh, and therefore you know, less children dying. Uh, also, people were taller after the 15th century. So uh, essentially, and again, we've got our little graph, but essentially um, both males and females were taller, um, suggesting, of course, better nutrition, better health generally, which allows you then obviously to attain greater height. 
I mean, we have, I mentioned already family graveyard, sorry, family burial areas, but um, we haven't actually had things like DNA analysis or anything done on any of the individuals yet, but we're hoping that we will, over the next few years, do uh, various tests on, on the, the skeletons. But this is just to show you, for example, in, in relationships here, that you have the coffin of a middle-aged man, um, and just above him here, uh, you have the burial of an older female. So uh, very likely that, the, that these individuals are buried. These were just two buried together. Very likely that this is a, you know, a husband and a wife buried in, in uh, the same plot. Uh, and I want to just very briefly talk about some of the diseases. Again, because we had such a large uh, collection of, of, of um, skeletons, you know, we've, been able to, we've been able to do statistics on the individuals. And so looking at, for example, um, arthritis, um, they've been able to see, obviously, how many people had arthritis of the spine. And we certainly noticed that on the dig, that when we were excavating, you know, a large number of people, seemed, their spines seemed to be quite badly affected by arthritis. Uh, this was actually, I excavated this individual who had incredibly bad arthritis of the knees. Um, and of course I sympathise, being a field archaeologist, you know, you, um, the arthritis of the knees is, is something that you have to, to deal with. But you can see here how they've, they've been able to obviously divide it up and quite a number of individuals with, you know, quite severe osteoarthritis. Um, and a much higher instance um, in, in younger adults uh, than, of course, today. And I think that would be expected where we... Uh, we know that people had to do much harder physical work and so were, would be much more prone to osteoarthritis. Uh, quite a lot of infection and again quite severe infection. Um, again, we know that um, for things like falling from height would um, cause you know, quite severe broken legs. Um, so we had quite a number of those, some of them uh, leading actually to, to osteomyelitis, of course, when infection gets into the bone. Uh, but this is a very nasty case where this person has had a broken lower leg. Um, unfortunately, their feet and all their upper body had gone, uh, cut by later burials. But you can see quite a normal knee and lower leg here. And then you can see the infected one here where infection has essentially fused all this into one bone and has fused all the ankle bones together. Um, and so quite a number of cases of this where quite severe infection um, you know, has um, well, not, not just in individual bones, sometimes over quite a lot of the body. One interesting thing is that sinusitis, um, although there are not a huge number of, of cases, um, there were quite a lot more in the pre-15th century period. Now, we, obviously with sinusitis, the sinus has to be broken to see, uh, unless you go in with a little endoscope, and so uh, we obviously couldn't see it for all of the individual. But the ones that were broken and they could see, um, you can see the pitting in, in, inside the, the sinus, that there are quite a lot more individuals before the 15th century. And one of the reasons for this, and this has been seen on other sites, is that ventilation in buildings was far better after the 15th century. In Aberdeen, we know that people, a lot more people were building in stone from the 15th century, and so they, would have had not, they wouldn't have had a central hearth, which would have you know, allowed smoke into the room, uh, causing, you know, causing things like breathing problems and sinusitis. So this is possibly um, some evidence for that. We also had quite a number of other diseases. I mean, this is just um, one case of, well, we had one severe case of syphilis. This is a young man, you know, in his late teens to very early 20s, um, who had a very severe case. Um, you can see the lesions on the skull, and we also had lesions on the legs and, um, on, and the arms. But also a small number of congenital syphilis um, passed on from the, from the mother onto, into children as well. So a small number of individuals with that. Lots of fractures, of course, as you would expect, and again, um, ribs and spines and arms, um, you know, quite badly affected, uh, a little bit more males and females, but of course quite different bones being broken in the medieval period than, than today because of the different sorts of accidents that people were having, a lot more things like falling from height in the medieval period, where we don't have so much of that with our health and safety and our um, you know, scaffolding and things like that. But one thing we had several cases of were, were head wounds and things like sharp and blunt force trauma. Uh, this is two of the blunt evidence of blunt force trauma here, one on the back of the head here, and this one on the top of the head here. Neither of these, of course, fatal, but also quite a number of fatal ones, uh, including this. This is the back of the knee here, so the, the femur here. And this is one of the um, osteoarchaeologists in Glasgow demonstrating with a ruler 
how this had happened. And this is the back of the leg, possibly somebody running away, moving away, and got sliced with a sword down the back of the leg, just above the knee. Uh, but also quite a number to the head, um, the one behind <laughs> here behind the ear on the top of the head, uh, and a couple of blunt force, like with a mace or something like that on the, on the tops of the head. But the worst case we had was this individual who had five fatal blade wounds to his head uh, and one non-fatal one. He had a little nick on the top of his head here, which was not fatal. But then somebody came and slashed the back of his head here, the side of his head, the side of his head here. And the worst one, which is when they put a sword and took away all of his top teeth here. And this is, if, we had, if I had a chance to do a reconstruction of a face, this is the one that I would do, because this is him. Um, he's obviously been in the wars prior to this incident, because he's got, well, apart from him being very muscly, uh, he's got quite a number of old injuries as well. But uh, he has a rather characterful face, I think. Um, a lot of cases of rickets, of course, but mostly in children. It appears that by adulthood, most people were better fed and better, um, you know, getting more sun. Um, and so most of the cases were, were, um, were children. Uh, apart from the individual I told you about for, before who had this case of, you know, adult rickets, which was just maybe part of another condition uh, and, didn't, and didn't heal. But also a lot of other dietary deficiencies. You would think possibly that Aberdeen, with all its fish and good you know, access to, to a lot of meat, would have an incredibly good diet. But a lot of people had uh, dietary deficiencies. Um, you could, pitting on the skull here and in the, in the orbit, suggesting iron deficiency anemia. Um, scurvy, again, mostly children uh, exhibiting this pitting sign of, of, of scurvy. Um, things like dental hyperplasia, which are incidents uh, in childhood, you know, when the teeth are growing, of illness or dietary deficiency, uh, quite a number of cases of those, uh, including some examples actually on the root, which is, very, which is not very common at all. So as the root is developing, when the child is a tiny baby, they're actually having problems with their diet uh, at that period. So quite a number of cases of that. Uh, but other things, of course, I mean, we have quite a number of cases of cancer, metastatic cancer, so different, you know, the sites on the ribs, uh, on the vertebrae, several different cases on, on the vertebrae themselves. Uh, and spina bifida, Aberdeen has quite a, um, a prevalence of spina bifida in medieval populations, slightly more than, than the norm. Uh, and again, we're not exactly sure why that is, um, but, uh, well, 16 individuals from this population. Uh, and this one case of scoliosis. Now, scoliosis is the um, you know, deforming of the um, vertebrae. So this is the vertebrae coming down here, the backbone here coming down like this. And uh, so this woman would have been very, very stooped over. Um, but what is one very severe case of, of that? Uh, and quite a lot of dental disease, as you would imagine, um, medieval populations have a lot of caries, a lot of abscesses, uh, and St. Nicholas was just the same as every other population, medieval population. Uh, we also had quite, we had six pipe smokers notches, which I rather like, um, including this man at the top left here who actually had smoked a pipe in one place for, well, what, 20 years or something, and then he decided he was going to move it over and make another notch. So whether it had got too loose for his pipe, we're not sure. Um, but of course, quite a number of pipes um, in with the burial layers suggesting, of course, probably the grave diggers certainly smoked. Um, but also this lovely little notch here um, in a middle-aged female from the 12th century period. Um, and of course, that's not pipe smoker, but maybe something to do with her occupation, maybe um, working in leather or textiles where she's pulling the, the leather or textiles between her teeth. Um, and very small number of people um, who are quite vain. We have um, a denture here. Um, again, from a, quite a late individual. Unfortunately, the rest of the individual were, were not present. This was a, just a, a mandible, which is loose in soil. Um, but he has a gold wire around his front teeth here. Unfortunately, the actual uh, denture has disappeared, so we don't know if it was a human, another person's tooth or a, an animal tooth or a ceramic tooth. But um, his tooth, teeth were incredibly poorly you know, um, rotten, and so uh, he was obviously trying to just to make them look a little bit better. Uh, but this very intriguing case here where we actually didn't notice this when we were excavating this individual, but in post-excavation, we found that there's a little um, block, like a little die, a block of bone that had been positioned on this back tooth. And you can see how rotten the teeth are here. 
um, and how this actually brings the, that tooth up to a level with the other teeth. Unfortunately, we have no idea how it was um, put in, kept in place, that it's possible that it was actually um, just put in for the burial, um, but we, don't, we haven't been able to find a parallel to this yet. Um, very, very sort of unusual case. And so really that's the, the sort of summary of what we found on the, on the excavation. I'm very happy, obviously, at the end to answer questions. But one of the things that we were always very um, concerned about was that St. Nicholas Church was not actually in the medieval borough of Aberdeen, that it was not in the area which was surrounded by the ports or gates, which were um, closed at times of attack or plague. Uh, and this is really just to show, this is Parson James Gordon's map, uh, 1661, which is the earliest map we have, or the earliest detailed map we have of Aberdeen. Uh, and essentially the medieval borough goes down here along, now this is the green, uh, down to the, up to the castle gate here, and then along to Old Aberdeen and up to, towards Old Aberdeen. So the little blue marks are showing the, the ports or gates. Um, and marked on the friaries, because of course also the friaries, most of them are outside the, the, um, the borough. So the black friars, the grey friars, the white friars, the red friars, but St. Nicholas Church, you can see it here, set um, you know, quite way out of the, of the ports or gates. Uh, so there's been quite a lot of speculation about the reason for this. Um, and of course, I think one of the reasons is that this was the highest point of the medieval borough, you know, that it was on a hill, it was on a, a high position. Uh, and so maybe didn't need, not necessarily need to be uh, within the ports. But of course, also, we know now that it's much earlier in date than we had thought, because although the, um, you know, the... The, the, the borough of Aberdeen really started in the 12th century. Uh, the church, of course, was probably there before that, or was there before that. Um, and so it's always been slightly separate from the, from the borough itself. So, I mean, we have been able to answer a huge amount of questions. Uh, I did say that, of course, the post situation isn't complete, and so this will be an ongoing process in the next few years to complete all that post excavation and then obviously find out a lot more about these individuals, hopefully be able to name some of them, We'll certainly know a lot more about their clothing um, and you know, their burial garments. Uh, and what's happening at the moment, and one of the reasons the post section isn't complete, is that obviously with the, the hard financial times that we have had, the church has struggled to make the money to uh, actually go ahead with the development. Uh, and so I'm very happy to, to say that they've actually started with phase one, which is this is the East Kirk encased in scaffolding to allow it to be made wind and watertight. And this is phase one of the development. Um, and they're hoping that obviously the other phases will, will follow um, shortly uh, and that obviously then as we get those extra phases we will then um, you know, get more of the, the post-excavation money. Right, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you.